We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Happy birthday, church. What a, what a cool day to be a part of uh, what God's doing here. Hey, before I get into the message today, uh, I wanted to share with you a few announcements that really kind of fit into some of the things that are going on. Uh, one thing, uh, if you remember, we're doing this, this initiative to fix our playground outside called Share to Care. If you weren't here a couple weeks ago to hear about that, every time you see the hashtag Share to Care on one of our Facebook posts, if you share it, all you have to do is click share, $9 gets put into an account of some, some generous donors to redo our playground. We already have about $2,000 raised in that account, so that's pretty cool. Um, playgrounds are a lot more expensive than I thought. They're like 60 grand. So we got a lot of sharing to do. So keep, keep those shares coming. Another thing I want you to know about is two Sundays from now, uh, we're going to have kind of a, a, most people's vacations be over. We'll be transitioning back into school and all that stuff. So there's going to be a lot of people here on August 20th, and we want to actually add even more people into the room. So we're asking you next week, to bring the name of someone that you would love to see a part of this faith community. Maybe they don't know Jesus yet, and you want them to, to meet Jesus here. And, and so bring their name and bring their mailing address. Because next week, we're going to have some little stations where you can send them an invite card, handwritten, saying, I'd love to have you join me next week. And you'll put their address on it. We'll stamp it and send it out for you. So bring that with you next week. That's going to be cool. Another thing to put on your calendar, August 29th and 30th, and if necessary, the 31st, we're going to be having a vision banquet here in this room. We're going to clear out all the chairs. We're going to put some round tables. We're going to cater. We're going to have a, a caterer come in and serve us dinner, and it doesn't cost you anything. All you have to do is sign up and come, and over those two nights or maybe three nights, you're going to hear more about what God's doing here and what God has planned for the future, and we're calling it our, our one degree more banquet. You might not know what one degree more means, but we'll make it make sense if you come to the banquet, all right? So you get to come, get free dinner, child care. It's great. You want to make sure to come. Uh, sign up online for that, all right? Uh, everyone good? Good. Well, we're really excited to be in the next part of our series. We have this week, and then next week, we're going to wrap up this series called I Will Build My Church. We're talking about what it means to be a church and what does it look like for us. And today, specifically, uh, we got our 25th birthday, so we're going to play into that, all right? But remember, Jesus is walking with his disciples. He's on the road, and, and he looks at them, and he says, hey, by the way, who do people say that I am? You know, what's the word on the street about who I am? And so the apostles give the different answers that they've heard, and then Jesus looks at Peter and he says, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter nails it, right? He says, well, you're Jesus. You're the, you're the Savior. And then Jesus looks at Peter and he says what has been the, the, the overarching verse for this series, right? He says in Matthew 16, 18, he says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. This is our, our theme verse for this series, because when Jesus says that he's going to build this church, and he's going to build it on, on the foundation of, of Peter, uh, the, uh, one of the apostles, that there's something powerful about what it means to be the church. And we're exploring that today. And since today is our 25th birthday, right? Since today is pretty special, here we are at 25 years uh, it makes sense to teach uh, 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 on a, a topic that I've written, uh, a church that lasts. What does it mean to be in a church that lasts? Uh, many of you have heard me before say what I think is my favorite part about being a pastor. 
My favorite job being a pastor happens right over here at this baptistry. When you get to see someone uh, who's made a decision to follow Jesus and then they get to, to, to publicly profess that and go under the water and come back up into new life, there's something so powerful about that. But if you haven't heard, the, the thing that I probably least like about my job, and, and I want to explain this so you understand, but probably the, the hardest part about being a pastor, without a doubt, for most pastors, is funerals. There's just something about funerals that, it, it, it's, it, listen, there's a joy and an honor in being able to partner with a family through that season of life. There's something special about it, but it is so draining and, and hard to do funerals. It really is. But some funerals, for whatever reason, there's something different about them. There's just a something in the air that's so different that actually you walk away from the funeral thinking, well, that was a really good day. And I'll tell you what the difference maker is. The first and most important thing is that when the person was a follower of Jesus, that brings joy into the whole experience of celebrating their life because you know they are still alive with Christ. The second thing, though, is when you know that the person has lived a life that they've left a legacy behind. And you get to hear stories and you're in there and you're talking about the deceased and you're hearing about all the ways that they've impacted a future that they're no longer gonna be a part of. It's so encouraging to say, what am I doing in my own life to be able to leave a legacy? Well, when you think about that concept, uh, there, there's actually a passage of scripture, Psalm 112, that believe it or not, is a psalm about legacy. It's about what does it look like to leave a legacy. Let me read it to you. Verses one through nine, it says, Praise the Lord, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever. Are you hearing all the legacy in here? All right. It says, light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. Such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Here it is. You ready? Their, their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. Well, when I think about what does it look like to be a church that lasts, here we are at 25 years. We've lasted for 25 years not only lasted, but I would say we we're thriving. There's something exciting going on in this place. Watching what God has done over this 25-year period has been an amazing blessing. It's a church that has lasted. But what do we need to do to continue to be a church that lasts? How cool would it be 25 years from now to see what God has done as the church continues to last? Now, I'll be honest. I would love for Jesus to come back before them. But if he doesn't, I want to look back and say, look at what is going on at Arundel Christian Church, because that is a church that has figured out how to last. And if you want to know how to last, what we got to do is, is understand this, this concept of a legacy. You know, legacy, if you're wondering, what, what is a legacy? A legacy is a future without you, but that is still impacted by you. And if we want to be a church that is influencing the world around us, the community around us. In other words, there's a question I think is really powerful. If a Arundel Christian church were to disappear tomorrow, would the world notice? Would the community notice? Would Glen Burnie care? Are we a church that's making a lasting impact and leaving a legacy? And so what's cool about Psalm 112 is that it's a recipe for legacy. It's a recipe for how to be a church that lasts, whether that's a, a, an individual that leaves a legacy or a family that leaves a legacy or a church that leaves a legacy. How many of you, when you're baking something or cooking something, you don't like recipes? You just like to eyeball it and, and experiment. How many of you are the experimenters in the room? 
Now, I bet for a lot of you experimenters, you know that sometimes that works out in your favor, and you get to try something you never had before, and it's amazing. And you also know sometimes that it fails miserably, right? You, you're thinking, I will never do that again. I'm, I'm more of a recipe kind of guy. I like to make up things as I go occasionally, and then when I nail it, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing, I'm kind of bummed that I can't go back and remember how much of each thing I put in there, because there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do this again, right? Well, Psalm 112 gives you a step-by-step -step recipe. If you want to be a person, or a family, or a marriage, or a church that lasts, and that leaves a legacy, well, you follow the recipe, all right? So we're going to look at the recipe and, and figure out the ingredients. The first thing we do in Psalm 112, if we want to be a church that lasts, number one, you have to live fearfully. Now you might be thinking, fearfully, I was always told not to, to give in to my, to be a, a, afraid. Well, let me, let me explain this. If we want to be a church that lives fearfully, so the second part of verse 1 there, Psalm 112. By the way, open up your Bibles to Psalm 112. We're going to keep going back to our recipe. It says, How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying His commands. How joyful. You're going to, you see that word joy. There's something really powerful here. Uh, this is not the same. When we think of fear, there's kind of two versions of fear that we think about, right? There's one kind of fear that's like the scary fear, like, like a jump scare, something, you know, creepy on Halloween, right? That kind of a fear where we're afraid. That's not the kind of fear that God is asking us to have here. This is a different kind of fear. It's more of a, uh, a reverent fear. It's an understanding the power of something. Listen, when you go up to an ocean, right, there's a reason that you, you go out only so far. There's a reason you don't swim yourself a mile into the ocean, because when you look at it, you have a reverence for the power of the ocean in front of you. You recognize that there's a, a, a kind of something that'll pull you under. There's animals living in there, and you're now in their home, and they're hungry, right? There's, there's things that are going on in the ocean where you say, this is incredible. It's so powerful. And I have a reverent fear of not uh, abusing the, the power of the ocean. There, you think of snakes, for example, right? A snake how many of you are afraid of snakes? How many are with me, right? There are snakes, by the way, most of them can't do anything to me, right? They're little, they don't have any venom, they don't bite, they're just kind of, and for whatever reason, I still don't want to be anywhere near them, right? I will treat them like they're going to kill me. And that's kind of a, a, the first kind of fear. I'm just afraid of, scared of snakes. But there's another part of, of snakes, a reason why we should be afraid, is that there's also a reverent respect for their potency, Right, we call God, right, omnipotent, which means all-powerful, omnipotent. That word potent, we understand that when we describe God, we're saying that there's something so powerful about him. When we're talking about a snake that's venomous, we recognize that that venom is potent, that it can hurt us, that it can do some regular big damage, right? It's, it's powerful. So we have a you know, if you come across a poisonous snake, you're probably going to show a little bit of reverence. And if we want to be a church that lasts, if you want to live a life of legacy, you have to understand the same thing. We need to live with that kind of reverence. We have to understand that God is big and he's powerful, and we, we want to be intentional about having that good kind of fear. It says in Proverbs 19, fear of the Lord leads to life bringing security and protection from harm. I love how, again, this one says that when we fear God, it's this, again, this, this powerful reverence and respect for the, the potency of his power, that it says it actually leads to life. It doesn't cause us to shrivel up and get into a little ball afraid of God. It, it actually brings joy. It brings security and protection from harm. There's actually studies that have been done where if you take a group of kids, uh, uh, like in a school setting, and you release them to recess into a yard that doesn't have a fence, 
what they tend to do is they all stay within about 50 feet of, of kind of within close realm of the door that they just left because they don't really know where the boundaries are and where it's safe to go and where it's not. And so they all kind of play close by the building. But you put a fence up around the yard and you give the clear boundaries and then everyone goes out and they play all the way out to the extension of where they can because there's all of a sudden now a protection and a joy that comes from the freedom of knowing where they're supposed to be and where they're not supposed to be. And when we want to be a church that lives fearfully, what we, what we do is we understand and recognize God you are good and you are powerful and you've given us this book and it shows us where boundaries are, where we should stay within and where we should not go beyond. And in doing so, we get to to respect your good word and we get to obey your command and we get to actually live our life with joy and peace and security. So if I were giving ACC a score, if this were a test, I want us to be a church that lasts, right? Right? So we're looking, to, is ACC a church that lives fearfully? Do you guys want to be graded on this? You know the greatest evidence for fear of the Lord? If you want to know, do I have a healthy fear of the Lord in my life? The greatest evidence for fear of the Lord is a life lived in obedience to God. If you're living in obedience to what God says or you're doing your best, listen, we all mess up, I get it. We all have our moments and we make mistakes. But in those moments, are you quick to say, oh man, I want to fix that because I want to live in obedience to God. Are we a church that is intentional about doing things God's way and living in obedience to God's formation for the church, uh, his vision for the church, what he's wanting for the church? Are we going in the direction that God wants to go? And when he gives us that vision and the direction, are we faithful to walk towards it without fear of man, but with a a reverent fear of who God is. And I would say absolutely, church, A. We get an A. ACC is not a church that lives in partial obedience or delayed obedience, but in full obedience to what God is asking us to do. And we certainly make mistakes along the way, but this is a church that fears God. Here's the second thing we see in our recipe. All right, so we understand that the first thing you got to put in there is living fearfully. The second thing we see is that a church that lasts thinks generationally. It thinks generationally. Let's look at that in, in Psalm 112, the next two verses. It says, Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever. Do you see in these two verses, you're getting these multiple generations of how one generation is impacting the next generation. I'm at the the midpoint of my life, uh, according to the science, right? Somewhere in the middle. And at some point around 40, uh, you're supposed to have a midlife crisis, uh, supposedly. I haven't had one yet. And so if anyone wants to loan their midlife crisis to me, maybe you bought a cool car, I can drive. Maybe it'll rub off, I don't know, a boat, something. I think one of the things about a midlife crisis that might save you from having one is if in that moment, you know you're in the middle of God's will for your life. You're right where God wants you to be. I think sometimes what happens is we see like, I think God wanted me to be further along by now and here I am stuck in a rut and that would probably cause a midlife crisis. But man, I am, I'm right in the middle and so I don't know, I'm at that part of my life where I don't know if I should call myself old or young. Anybody else there? I think if you don't know if you're old or young, my advice to you is I'm learning, you're old, okay? <laughs> I, st- I think I'm old now, at least my body is starting to tell me I'm old, but I still feel like I'm young, but I can't do all the things I want to do when I was, anyway. So I have some advice for two different age groups. If you're in this room and you're old, all right, I got some advice for you. Because we want to be a church that thinks generationally, right? Here's my advice. You're not going to find anywhere in scripture the word retirement. That doesn't mean that there isn't a moment in time where you should stop your vocation and start enjoying the fruits of, of how you've prepared for that moment. You should totally retire if you can do it, right? That's a pretty cool thing. But the, the concept of resting from work 
We don't find in Scripture uh, from a perspective of God, until he calls you home, there is still work for you to do in building his kingdom. In fact, there's a reason uh, older folks, okay, half of us in this room, there's a reason that they call the golden years the golden years. And it's because those are the years of your life where you have likely the most opportunity to leave a lasting impact and to make a difference for the next generation. You most likely have more financial security than you had when you were younger. You probably have more time on your hands, uh, especially after retirement from like a vocation than you did when you were younger. You have a whole lifetime of experience. You have a lifetime of wisdom. You have so much that you can pour into the younger generation uh, my question would be, are you doing that? Are you doing that? When Titus 2 talks about training up the younger generation, are you doing that? Wouldn't it be cool if the older generation, instead of resenting the younger generation, chose to disciple the younger generation instead of resenting them? And now, for those of you who consider yourselves younger, and if you, again, if you're not sure... You can pick, I guess, but I think you're probably older. If you're younger, here's what my advice to you would be. If someone tries to tell you that you are the church of tomorrow, I want you to stop them and say, uh -uh, I am the church of today. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are part of the body of Christ. There is no reason that you should have some sort of pause button on until the older generation finally says, all right, all right, you can take over now. No, everyone in this room, if you are a believer, you are the church. With, along with other people, you make up the body of Christ. So I want to encourage you, if you're a younger person in this room, recognize that you are the church of today. All right? If I were to give ACC a score for thinking generationally, one of my favorite things about this church is that when I look around a room like this, I see all the generations. I see really, really young people. I see really, really old people. I see everyone in between. You know one of my favorite things about this church is we have more babies being born here than we do funerals here. That's good. I will say, if you go into a church nursery and there's no babies in it, that's a really unfortunate sign of a lack of health. And our, our nursery has grown so much that we had to actually dedicate a whole nother room for nursery room number two, which is really cool. I love that God is doing things here and that we're thinking generationally. I, think about this for a moment. There are babies that'll be born this year that at the church's 50th anniversary celebration, they'll only be 25 years old. But how cool would it be if right now we're thinking, what can I do to make sure that the church that we are all a part of at this moment is something that is building a legacy and that we're creating something powerful that, that that baby born this year can be a part of and that would be powerful and make a difference in their life. Here, here's a third. By the way, I'll, I'll give you an A, okay? A for the first one, A for the second one. I, I made it sound like I'm just kind of like mustering it up. You guys, we're, we're doing really strong on that. We're thinking generationally, without a doubt, A. All right, a church that lasts number three. A church that lasts, according to Psalm 112, is a church that shines brightly. Shines brightly. Let's look at verse 4 and 5. Remember, this is our recipe book. It says, Light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. You know what I love about this? It quickly ties together this concept of a light shining in the darkness. It takes that concept and connects it with action, right? We know that actions speak louder than words. If you want to be a person or if we want to be a church that's shining brightly for Jesus, it doesn't just take a right? 
It's going to take action. What kind of action? Well, it's a generosity and compassion and righteousness. These are things that when we do them as a church, we're going to be shining brightly in this world. It says in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, it says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, and have a good day, stay warm, and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Here's what James is, is getting at. James is trying to explain that if you want to shine brightly, there are going to be actions that back up your words. We're not just going to be a church that says, community, we love you. We're going to actually love our community. There's going to be actions behind our words. Certainly, there's an importance of words. You can't tell people about the love of Jesus unless you open up your mouth and you tell them the gospel, right? We got to use words. But then we can, we can actually demonstrate the gospel by the way we live our lives, changed, radically changed by the love of Jesus. So if we want to be a church that lasts, we have to be a church that shines brightly. Matthew 5 says it this way in verses 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see, we as a church long to be a church that's up on a hill proudly displaying the inaction, the generosity, and the righteousness, and the compassion of Jesus for our world to see. Every time you're generous, compassionate, and righteous, and, and, and choosing to live life in a certain way that honors the truth of God's Word, by the way, you are a bright, shining light for Jesus. So if I were to give ACC a score for this one, I have some questions to ask. Does the world see this church sharing its resources generously with those who are in need? I would say without a doubt. I love, one of my favorite things about this church is watching how this church makes a difference in our community. Do we go into the world with compassion and care for those who are lost and hurting? You know, this year we sent, we just got an update last week Right? We sent four teams in, on, on missions trips and others in our church that have gone off and, and served in, in making a difference in this world for those who are lost and hurting. Next year, instead of four short-term mission trips, we're upping that to eight. We're doubling it next year. Are we intentional about pursuing righteous living? Listen, I get it. There's not a perfect person in this room. This is not a perfect church. But are we intentional about doing our best to improve in the way we live and honor Christ with our decisions and our actions. Church, I, I give us a strong A. Again, I think we're a church that is doing what it takes to last. Here, here's a fourth thing. This one's probably my favorite. <laughs> if you want to be a church that lasts, number four, you're going to walk confidently. You're going to walk confidently. We actually have a word for someone who walks confidently. What's that word? Got a strut. That's that's good. That's not the word I wrote down, but that's a good one. What? Swagger, right? I, maybe swag is the new generational way of shortening it. I was thinking of the word swagger, right? You know, when someone walks in a room, I don't really have good swagger, but I'm going to try to model it for you. Right? When they walk in, they're just like, 
They just like head up. I don't care what you think about me. I, I, I think I, the way I'm dressed, the things that I stand for, where I'm at, when I'm there, all those things. Like I'm confident. I walk into this place and I'm good to be here and I don't really care what anybody else thinks about it. We call that swagger. But probably my version of swagger for my wife and I, we love weddings, especially weddings that have a reception with dancing, okay? Because uh, we love to dance. And when we go to a wedding, we typically will be out on the dance floor more than uh, most people. We like to stay out there. And, and I'll, t- I'll be honest with you. I'm not a great dancer. My wife's not a phenomenal dancer. The thing that sets us apart when we're on the dance floor, and by the way, this, this trick works for everyone in this room, okay, is just a little thing called confidence, You just go out there, and if you don't really care what anybody thinks, and you just go out there and have a good time, all the people who are sitting down thinking, man, I really don't want to dance because I'm not a good dancer, and all these people are going to laugh at me. They're looking at me, and I'm not a good dancer, and they're thinking, wow, he's having a really great time. I didn't know he could dance. (laughs) I I just got like dance swagger, I guess. Like I'm not a great dancer. I just love it. There's a confidence that comes from just... I don't know, not caring what other people think. In Psalm 112, verse 6, it says, Such people will not be overcome by evil. When you read a verse like this, it says these people, you hear the confidence in this. If you go into a battle knowing that you will not be overcome, that you are not going to lose, if you go into a game and you just know like you're playing the Oakland A's, right? You're like, we're going to kill this thing, right? It's going to be a good day. You just know that you, got, you can walk in with confidence because you know you're going to win. It's a pretty powerful type of confidence. There's a, there's a captain of a ship, and he was in his quarters, and his crew looks out with binoculars or a telescope or whatever, and they see this pirate ship coming. And, and so they go to the captain. They say, Captain, there's a pirate ship approaching. Uh, what should we do? And he says, well, tell the men to, to man their, the, the, our, bat, their battle stations and get their armor, and please bring me my red shirt. The guy's like, okay. And so he brings the captain his red shirt, he puts it on, they go out there and they, they defeat the pirates, and the pirates leave in defeat. And so the next day, uh, there's two pirate ships coming. So they go to the captain, they say, Captain, there are two pirate ships coming, what should we do? He says, tell all the men to get ready for battle and, and bring me my red shirt. He's like, okay, this is weird. So same thing. They defeat the, the pirates and they go away and they're, they're, they're all celebrating that night and they're, they're enjoying the fact that they've won two battles now. And they go up to the captain and they say, Captain, what's the deal with the red shirt? Is that like your lucky shirt? Is that, does that, what's the deal? And he says, no, well, I put it on so that if I get wounded, uh, nobody can see the blood and the men will continue to, to, to have encouragement and, and, and encourage to fight. And they're like, wow, our captain is so brave and smart. He's such a smart guy. And so the next day, they, they come into the captain's quarters and they say, Captain, there are 10 pirate ships and they're all coming right towards us. What should we do? He says, tell the men to grab their armor and to man their battle stations and bring me my brown pants. You like that? It's a good one. There's, there's something about confidence in knowing when you've already won a battle before you even go into it. When Jesus looks at his church and says, listen, church, not even the powers of hell are going to be able to overcome this thing. Do you know that Satan hates the fact that he knows he's already lost and that you should know that you've already won. And we can walk confidently as a church. If we want to be a church that lasts, we can know that we are not going to be overcome by evil. In fact, the, the verse goes on. It says in verses 7 and 8, they do not fear bad news. They confidently trust in the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. Now you see that verse and you're like, well, here it says that we're supposed to be fearless. You just told us that we're supposed to live fearfully. Well, this is two different kinds of fear, right? We, we can not care at all about fearing man because all of our fear is in a reverent understanding and respect of the power of God and that he's already won the battle. That's what it looks like to walk confidently. 
You see, faith is found in what you are believing for, not found in, or sorry, faith is not found in what you are believing for. Faith is found in who you are believing in. And when we know that our faith is in a God who's already won the battle, boy, does that give us the ability to swagger into, swagger into church, man. Here's a, a score. If I were to give us a score for this, does ACC know confidently that our God has already won the battle? I believe we do. Do we know, we, do we look back at 25 years and see evidence after evidence after evidence of God doing a powerful, mighty work, victoriously beaten up on the devil in this place? Without a doubt. I think we're a church that can walk confidently. And so I give us an A. Hey. Here's the last one, the fifth one. A church that lasts also, according to this recipe, gives generously. In Psalm 112, verse 9, the first part of the verse says, they share freely and give generously to those in need. Do you know that giving is probably the most eternal legacy building thing that you can do? It's one of the most powerful ways you can leave a legacy is through the generosity of your time and the generosity of your finances, the generosity of your resources. When you lend those things, or not even lend them, but give them to others who need them, you can make a huge lasting impact in the future. When I think about that question, if this church were to disappear tomorrow, would our community notice? I have no doubt that our world would notice. I have no doubt that this community would feel the pain of the generosity of our Wendell Christian church disappearing. Uh, a woman named Corey Ten Boom, whom I res respect and admire so greatly, she said, the measure of a life, after all, is not about its duration, but it's donation. And so I would want to ask the question, is ACC a church that is generous? I love looking at all the ways that ACC is making a long-lasting, eternal impact in this community. And so for that reason, I'll give us another score for number five would be another A. Here's why I don't think it would be a good idea to give us an A plus on any of these things. Because... Just like any other church, we got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of impact we could make in this community that we haven't made yet. There's a lot of love and generosity and righteousness that we could pursue that we haven't pursued yet. There's a lot of fearing God that we haven't really figured out yet. When I ask the, the question, what now, God? I want us to think about this question today, not so individually, but as a church. God, what do you want us to do as a church body? What is it that Arundel Christian Church needs to do today based on this truth? When I look at the end of Psalm 119, or 112, verse 9, it kind of gives us how the psalm ends. It says, their good deeds will be remembered forever, and they will have influence and honor. And when I see this last verse, uh, uh, the last part, sorry, of verse 9, what it's really saying is, if you want to be a church that lasts, you've got to follow this recipe, right? At some point, if you follow the recipe, what comes out of the oven is right here. Your good deeds will be remembered forever, and ACC can be a church that will have influence and honor. But you know, there's actually one other verse in Psalm 112. Verse 10, it says this. It says, the wicked will see this and be infuriated. They will grind their teeth in anger. They will slink away, their hopes thwarted. You know what I think of when I read this last verse? When I, when I see a church that's being a church that's going to last, a church that's making an influence, and then I read this verse, it reminds me of the promise that Jesus made to Peter. 
He says, Peter, you're the rock, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. And not even the evil, not even the wicked, nothing is going to be able to overcome the church. Jesus says, I will build my church, and not even the powers of hell will conquer it. So church, our what now, what we need to continue doing, I believe we're doing it, and I think we need to keep doing it. You ready? I already gave them to you five things. We need to live fearfully and reverent of God's incredible power. We need to think generationally. We need to shine brightly. We need to walk confidently with some swagger. And we need to give generously. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this day. As we look back over 25 years, we are an incredibly grateful church to see all the work that you've done. It's incredible to see what you've done in and through this place. And that we know that we're a church right now that you're blessing that's, that's following this, this recipe. And that we know that we're going to be able to celebrate in the future how you continue to work in the future. But God, right now we are so thankful for allowing us to be a part of the story that you're writing here at Arundel Christian Church. God, thank you for letting me be a small part of this this book and for each one of us to be a part of this this thing that you're doing here. And we are so grateful to be a part of the work and to look back and celebrate it with joy. We ask that you continue to do a powerful work here. Let us be a church that lasts as we seek to honor you in these different ways. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.